this is hysteroscopy. The indications and contraindications for this procedure, the general way to think about it is just like laparoscopy, but it's for the but it's for the uterus and also the, the cervix and a cervical canal. And that means that it's a way to minimally invasively diagnose and treat uh, diseases in that area. So you can think about it just like um, laparoscopic procedures. And the two main categories of indications that um, require hysteroscopy are diagnosis and treatment of bleeding, so that could be cancer or postmenopausal bleeding, bleeding from a polyp, leiomyoma. Then you can do, you can uh, treat the bleeding this way as well. So you can do ablation, um, you could biopsy, you could resect. And the second major category for indications are structural or anatomic issues or problems. So you could um, look for a septum, foreign bodies, adhesions, again polyps. You can uh, perform treatments like a sterilization. You can investigate endometrial thickening, and this is the structural and anatomic part of this is uh, real important for in infertility workups. So the contraindications, the absolute ones are PID and perforation. So perforation is a problem with this because you're distending the uterus. Um, you're, just you're distending the uterus with the distension medium, which is usually um, a liquid, which could also be CO2. And so if there's a hole, the distension media could uh, could get pushed out into the peritoneum, so you'd want to, you wouldn't want to do it then. And then the relative contraindications are um, a known cancer, because there's this theoretical concern that you could flush uh, cancer cells with the, the distension media and the pressure that you're putting on um, out of the uterus and the f and the fallopian tubes into the peritoneum. So you so you um, you might not want to do this procedure in that case. The anatomy review, there's not a whole lot of, of um, new anatomy that you're not familiar with here. There's just the um, vaginal opening in the cervix, so you get good visualization of the cervix by using um, a speculum to see it, and then you might need to dilate it, so you can use um, the mechanical dilators or mesoprostol or laminaria if it's a more difficult dilation. And then you put the scope um, into the uterus through the cervix, and you want there to be a tight fit between the scope and the and the and the and the the uterus because you're, you need to put the the media in there to d to distend it and that has to um, seal fairly tightly. How the hysteroscope itself works, there's so they have a, a light source and a camera. You use um, fiber optic light, so that gives you nice light without heat, it allows you to see what's going on. And then you have the inflow and outflow of the distension media, so that that could be here. So you have the media going in, and then you also have it. Um, coming out, then you have the operate operative channel. So that's right here, and that's where you put in um, whatever you're using to do whatever the tools that you need to do the operation: so electrosurgical tools, electrocautery tools, things to morselate or biopsy. And then you see what you're doing uh, on a video screen. The, as far as the distension media go, there's two general categories of distension media. So the first one is the uh, the ones that can conduct electricity and do have electrolytes. These are electrolyte-rich solutions, for example, normal saline and lactated ringers. You know what the difference between normal saline and lactated ringers is? They're, they're pretty, they're very similar, except the lactated ringers has some, some extra stuff. So it also has uh, potassium, lactate, uh, and calcium added to it, and normal saline is just 0.9% NaCl. And so if you're using the um, the distension media that do have electrolytes and can conduct electricity, then you don't want to use electrosurgery that is uh, monopolar. So that would be a contraindication to using monopolar electrosurgery. And we'll talk about the difference between monopolar and bipolar in just a minute. And so the other general category of distension media is those that do not con conduct electricity and do not have a lot of electrolytes. So those are electrolyte pore solutions. An example of that is glycine. Okay, so when you're using these ones, you can use use monopolar, and the 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 non the non conducting electrolyte pore solutions are more likely to cause hyponatremia, and they're also more likely to cause fluid overload. Although um, both of these distension media can cause fluid overload. Well, fluid overload is with the the med distension media that you're putting into the uterus the, is is under pressure, and that can actually push fluid into the vasculature and get that fluid. Um, in, in, in the circulation, so that's what fluid overload means. It's more likely to happen um, when the, the pressure that you're using to distend the uterus is very high. So the higher the pressure is in the uterus above the uh, MAP, the mean arterial pressure, then the more likely that you're going to have um, fluid overload. So you want the pressure to be as, as low as possible in the uterus to get you the visualization that you need. 
And so the fluid deficit is something that you monitor, and it's a way to um, prevent a pr problems with, fl with fluid overload. And so you monitor the deficit um, of the fluid that's going in and coming out. So we saw the picture of that um, scope earlier in cross-section, and the, you can see that there's the channel for the fluid to come in and, and come out, and the machine actually keeps track of the difference. So you, you want to look at that and also take into account um, fluid that may have leaked out or um, if the seal isn't, isn't, isn't very good, and that's usually collected in a bag, um, sort of sitting under the person. So you want to see what the machine says and can take into account any, um, any other things that you've noticed with regards to fluid. And if, you, if you, the fluid deficit gets to a, over um, half a liter, you want to start to think about wrapping the procedure up or possibly um, stopping to, to avoid um, overloading the person with too much fluid. So CO2 is another distension media that's that's used. I didn't see it used, but it can be used for diagno diagnostic um, procedures. So electrosurgery and electrocautery, these, these things are actually a little bit different. So electrocautery is when you have a tool like this and you have like an electrode inside that heats it up and then you actually touch the um, you actually touch the hot the hot surface of the tool to whatever you're, to whatever you're um, cutting or, or coagulating, and it and it basically burns it. Whereas electrosurgery, you have a, you have an electrode that transmits electricity outside of it, and the electricity that it transmit is that it transmits is what does the actual um, cutting or coagulating. So when you're talking about electrosurgery, there's two types: there's the monopolar type and the bipolar type, and so the monopolar type is shown over here and you, and the bipolar type is over here so for the monopolar type we'll start with the with the box that generates which generates the voltage or the potential difference of electricity and so that's called the electrosurgical unit then you have your your lead here going to the tool that you're using and so that's one pole and then you have um, a dissipating or a grounding pad going back to the electric, electrical surgical unit. So like the electricity comes out of of the tool that you're using, and then it's going to follow the path of least resistance. So let's say you didn't have a grounding or a dissipating unit, and maybe this person had an IV in, or they had an um, EKG lead in. The electricity might travel from the other tool that you're using to the IV or the EKG lead, and then out of the person, and that and that could cause damage. That could cause um, damage it cause it could burn it could basically burn the patient as, as the electricity is leaving. So that's why you, when you're using the monopolar, you use the dissipating pad or the grounding pad so that the electro electro surgically so that the electricity has a a set path to fall that's not going to hurt the patient. And the reason that the, when you're using the grounding pad when the electricity is leaving the person doesn't hurt them is because it has a big surface area. So the electricity is pretty spread out so it can't um, constant it can't um, concentrate and, and and burn the patient. So when you're using bipolar. The difference here is that you're not the electricity isn't passing um, through the patient to a grounding or dissipating pad. It's passing from um, one pole. It's passing from one pole to the other in the machine they're using through the tissue. So it's just like like a typical electrical su circuit diagram. You have the electrical surgical unit just like you do in monopolar that generates the voltage, and then you have the electricity going. Um, from one pole to the other through the resistance, which would be the, the tissue that you're cutting or coagulating, back into the other pole and um, to the electrosurgical unit, all within the tool that you're using. So the electricity shouldn't actually be passing through the patient. And so when you're using um, when you're using uh, bipolar, you can use that if when you're using a conducting uh, distending media. So for the preoperative um, endometrial and cervical preparation, the endometrial preparation has to do with being able to see well what's going on so you you don't if you're in the follicular phase which has two parts um menstrual and proliferative you you don't want to do this procedure if you're in the, in the menstrual phase if, if possible because um it'll be hard to see with the blood and the proliferative phase is is uh, the best time to do it because there's the, there's no longer the blood but the endometrial lining hasn't uh, built up significantly like it does in the secretory phase like it does in the secretory or luteal part, 
um, which could make it hard to see things like polyps. So proliferative phase is the best. Um, menses try to avoid secretory might it might make it harder to see what's going on because the endometrial lining will be so built up. And so you can use pharmacological thinning if you want to prepare um, the uterus for this procedure. So if you want to make sure that the endometrial lining is thin, you can give um, progestins or put somebody on um, OCPs, which should help thin the endometrial lining. And then cervical preparation, that might it might you might need to dilate the cervix uh, before you can put the scope in. So there's two ways to do that. And we talked we talked about this in the, the dilation and keratage lecture, but the main ways are mesoprostal or using laminaria. So preoperative, um, just the general just the general type of stuff. You, you, anesthesia from paracervical block. Um, to general, depending on what you're planning on doing, if you're doing like a big resection, then you might want to. Um, there might be general anesthesia, and usually, if they're coming into the hospital, then they're probably, you, as opposed to getting this done in the office, then they're probably um, going to be under general. You don't necessarily need any antibiotics or Foley for this procedure. So set up and inserting the scope, so you, you, you get good visualization with the speculum, dilate the, the cervix to the size of the scope, put the scope in to get a nice seal, and you examine the endocervix as you're going along, go through the endocervical canal to the uterus, distend the uterus with the distension media, use the lowest pressure that you can to get good visualization, look at the ostea, look for pathology, um, perform any of the procedures that you're that you're going to be doing. So that this is a picture of, the, of an ostium, and you want to kind of regardless of what you're doing, you want to find the ostium. Uh, you want to find both ostea because that means you've sort of looked at the entire um, uterine cavity. If you if you can't see one of the ostea, then there's, there's um, and if you can't see an ostea, then there's probably an area of the uterine cavity that you haven't looked at, and that might be an area where there's, where there's a problem. So this is just a picture of what um, an ostea looks like, what an ostium looks like. Fibroids, knowing the types of fibroids are, is important for this procedure because it's a common way that, that they're evaluated and treated. So we'll just do this quiz style. So what's fibroid A called? It's a subserosal fibroid. How about um, the B fibroids? Those are sub, those are um, muscle fibroids, intramural fibroids. Um, and the C fibroids are submucosal fibroids. And then the fibroids like um, D are uh, pedunculated ones. And so polyps, another common indication that you should probably know something about before this. Um, so this is just a picture of a polyp. It's not actually an endometrial polyp, but you can see the, the gland stroma and the fibrovascular core. Um, it's good to know that the vast majority of are benign, greater than 95%. The number one symptom of these is bleeding. They can be um, flat or sessile or pedunculated. And when do you want to remove these? You want to remove these. Any, if any, if a person's having symptoms, you take them out. Also, if the person's postmenopausal, you take them out. Um, and if the person has endometrial cancer risk factors, you take them out. So, what are the endometrial cancer risk factors? There's there's two categories. So, the one is age, and the second is unopposed estrogen. Unopposed estrogen. So, like, so what are the factors that? Um, what are the things that lead to unopposed estrogen? Like obesity, um, early early menarche, late menopause, um, nulliparity, all those type of things that, that give you the unopposed estrogen or risk factors. This is another picture of what adhesions look like through a scope, and this is an example of um, adhesions uh, caused by astromans. The, the uterine abnormalities, remember the two big the two big categories of indications are to investigate and treat things having to do with bleeding or to investigate and treat um, structural abnormalities. So knowing the types of uterine abnormalities is important here, so the the, um, the uterus cervix on part of the vagina is formed by the two paramecenephric or malarian ducts coming together and joining. So if you have two ducts, which is the normal setup, but they don't come together and join, then you have um, double everything. The picture that is shown here is a bicornuate uterus. So you have um, the two paramecenephric or malarian ducts like you're supposed to, but, um, but when they come together, they don't completely join. So the the, post, the the posterior part joins, but the superior part doesn't, so that's bicornuate. Unicornuate is when you only have one um, paramecenephric or malarian duct. Septated is you have two, they come together and join sort of like they should, but there's a septum in between. Then you have a genesis, which, so you have um, neither duct and you just have a rudimentary vagina. So complications and post -op from this, they're very rare. Um, the most common are perforation, fluid overload, uh, bleeding, vasovagal, um, we talked about fluid overload, so is that more common with um, 
so that fluid overload, just remember that has to do with the distension media getting pushed intravascularly, and it's important to keep track of the pressure and the fluid deficit. A perforation, for example, that could come when you're doing a procedure or it could come when maybe you're using um, dilators, like mechanical dilators, to, to dilate the cervix. Um, it's a procedure that you can go home the same day and re resume normal activities as tolerated. So some questions that you can get asked. Um, you can get asked things about so you're using this distension media, maybe it's kind of the first time you've seen that, so you could get asked about what are some issues with that, so you can mention the fluid overload, the hyponatremia, you could talk about how there's two types, there's the electrolyte rich, the electrolyte poor, and the complications tend to be more common with the electrolyte poor, like the glycine. Then there's the where does the fluid go, so if you're talking about the fluid deficit, you could say where does it go, and you know, if you, you might think that, well, it's you're putting this fluid in, it's under pressure, it's probably just going to shoot out of the out of the tubes into the peritoneum, the fallopian tubes into the peritoneum, but most of it actually gets pushed um, intravascularly. And then that you could you could get quiz on the location and names of uh, lyomyoma, so you should know that just from outside to inside you go subserosal, intramural, submucosal. With 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 polyps, with what are the endometrial cancer risk factors? Let's go with the age and the unopposed estrogen that should get you started. And then you could ask um, something that I was wondering is so why do you use if the um, non-conducting distension media, you know, causes tend to causes more hyponatremia or, and um, more hypon hyponatremia or, and um, and fluid overload. Why why would you use that as opposed to the conductive? Is is it important so that you can use? Um, do you would you use the conducting like um, lactated ringers, normal standing, so that you can use monopolar um, surgery, or 